Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. In this week's episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, I speak with Dr. Jacqueline Lindo of the University of Hawaii's Kapi'olani Community College. We talk about why Jacqueline decided to flip her economics classroom and the approach taken to do just that, the unique Hawaiian land-based learning method that she has integrated into her teaching, how she has been able to teach economics through the lens of fisheries, as well as sharing with us some information on the economy of Hawaii and how its landscape has changed over time. You can check out all the links, books and resources mentioned by Dr. Lindo over at the show notes page at economicrockstar.com forward slash Jacqueline Lindo. Never miss an episode of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Visit economicrockstar.com, submit your name and email, and you will get each episode straight to your inbox. But the sugarcane plantations are gone. The pineapple plantations are gone. And we've seen Hawaii's even agricultural landscape changing for better or for worse. So there's been a lot of change over the last several decades in terms of Hawaii's economy looks like. But tourism, definitely. And construction. Construction is another big one, like residential commercial construction. Aina in Hawaiian means land. In their culture, it means much more than just the land that there is. It's really kind of what we consider gifts from nature in economics, right? Anything in any natural resource. But it's more of a cultural, spiritual connection to the life behind the land. And um, the Native Hawaiian and, and most indigenous cultures around the world, they perceive this kind of symbiotic relationship with the land. If, if you take care of the land, the land is what's taking care of you. Hi, Frank Conway here, and you're listening to the Economic Rockstar Podcast. I am so honored to have Jacqueline Lindo join me today. Hi, Jacqueline. Welcome to the show. Hi, Frank. Thanks for having me. Dr. Jacqueline Lindo is an economics instructor at the University of Hawaii's Kapi'olani Community College, where she teaches principles level courses and advises the Economics and Business Club. Dr. Lindo flipped all of her courses using a combination of publisher-produced videos and her own problem-based collaborative in-class assignments. She strives to make her course material as relevant to students' experiences and interests by using pop culture as well as integrating local issues. Jacqueline will be part of the first cohort of faculty to integrate land-based learning into their pedagogy with the aim of promoting learning that is rooted in native Hawaiian values place-based research and community engagement to understand community needs. Jacqueline previously lectured on health economics at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, continuing with her expertise as a senior health economist at Hawaii Health Information Corporation. While there, Jacqueline researched healthcare policy and outcomes at the national and local levels. Jacqueline completed her PhD at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2011. Jacqueline, a very nice diverse background in terms of your economics profession and you've worked in healthcare and or in health economics at the Hawaii Health Information Corporation and you've also carried that through in the University of Hawaii, Hawaii and then continued on in your current community college. Yeah, I, I just could never leave school. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, teaching um, throughout grad school, mostly undergraduate courses, and when I was hired on full-time at Hawaii Health Information Corporation, they allowed me to have a flexible schedule to still teach one or two course, one or two sections um, each semester. So I was always able to keep both one, well, one and a half feet in research and um, half a foot in the classroom teaching. What interested me regarding your bio there was your flipped classroom. And I'd be very much interested in kind of getting a deep dive in how you and why, firstly, you decided to flip your classroom. Sure. When I was at UH Manoa, which is a four-year university, as most four university, your universities have, the principals of a classes had about 175 to 200 students lecture style in a you know, movie theater looking classroom. And I didn't really get to connect with individual students beyond the few who came into office hours. So making the transition to a community college where our courses are capped at 35 students was a big change for me because that 
standard lecture style that I used with the larger sections just was not effective for our community of learners. So I thought I needed to leverage that intimate class size to provide a better experience for both of us. And I had gone to a few professional development activities and I I kept hearing about this flipped classroom concept that some instructors were a little hesitant about and others had really found success with it. So I thought I'd give it a try. And the first semester I did it, I'd have to say I wasn't fully committed. I kind of just dipped my toe in the water and I worked closely with the author of our, our textbook Eric Chang, who has a series of pre-lecture materials that I I really found value in. And I I assigned them as optional just to see if students would would take to it and do it. And then I converted the following semester to a requirement. You have to do this to prep to come to class, assign a few points to it, and students are definitely more (laughs) incentivized to complete it. And then the following, the, la- the third semester, which was last semester, I integrated all of their assessments, whether it's in-class assessments or a um, little short quick Q&A after they complete the video series. So it was a, it was a layered approach. And I kind of adjusted as I went along. I found what worked and what, what didn't work well. So it did take a little while, but I've got it to a point where they're I'd say 95% of them are regularly completing their pre-lecture work at home because I also learned I needed to somehow ensure that they're going to engage in class. So I have a system um, to award them participation points that I could explain to you if I don't know if, if anyone would be interested. But I think without that, you don't fully capitalize on the knowledge, the new knowledge that they're bringing in. So I think it's a combination of getting them to do the work before they come to class, but also ensuring they're applying it once they're in the classroom. Jacqueline, I'd be definitely interested in hearing about the participation points. But before we get to that, I'd be really interested in finding out how apprehensive you might have been or even the the community college that you work in, the University of Hawaii's Kapiolani Community College how did they support you in this initiative? Because this this is something that is been has been tried and tested in a few places. There is positive and negative outcomes on this. And from all accounts, from what you're saying there, you found some things you had to tweak, but all in all, there was a good participation rate there. Yeah, I think it's really a function of how committed you as an educator are to that particular methodology. And my problem was that I had a hard time covering all the material we needed to in a fixed time period without them feeling rushed and without kind of shoving it down their throats. And so I needed a way to use that classroom interaction time to give them opportunity to put their new knowledge to work, to see what they grasped and what they needed to spend more time on. So I needed them to do more of the learning on their own, which they're very capable of. It does require repetition, as we all know in economics, and, you know, a little further extension through some lecture. So I I do have lecture um, interspersed with in-class activities, but a lot of it they can get on, on their own. And at least if they have that initial exposure, I knew I could help them take that deeper dive. So I was personally just very committed to making it work. We have instructional support, and we also have the tech-based instructional support on campus that if you want assistance with your efforts, it's available. And, and I could have used those resources, but I was new that first year, and I, I didn't really know many people. I didn't take that initiative um, to, to use those resources, so a lot of it I actually did on my own and figured it out while I was doing it. The feedback initially that I got from the students who did it optionally They said they really liked the video series that I had assigned. And in addition to, you know, a paid material, I also had them using some YouTube video series that I thought were very high quality from other community college faculty. And that and that's complimentary. So I had them use both. They said they did like both. They complimented each other well. And because those students who did access it found value and said this was so much easier than just reading the text the first time. I decided as long as I can get them to do it, they would gain, they would, they would perform better in the end. So this is, I'm in the second semester now of the fully flipped classroom. And 
I had all but one student last semester pass the class. So they were very happy with it at the end. And um, I, I wasn't getting that result prior to this, at least in this setting. So I know it wouldn't work for every instructional setting and for every instructor, but it does for my small, intimate classroom and with my particular audience of learners. I suppose you have the benefit of having that small group of students in which you can interact and not leave anyone outside or get lost in that interaction where you, you it might happen in a larger group. Exactly. I, I couldn't see doing this in a class with more than 40 to 50 students. I do know the names of every single student in all five sections that I teach. It's such a great benefit of a small classroom size that even the ones who just, they see the 10% participation score and they just want to drop the class immediately. And I tell them, I was you when I was an undergraduate. If I saw credit for participation, I was already looking for another section to switch to. But I told them that economics is really something that, while it can be learned independently on your own, it really takes you to another level of understanding when you interact and discuss. Even if you don't have it, you know, quite under your belt, when you start talking about it and start applying it in connection with another person, it, it it's so much more beneficial. So um, I help them out. I give them some time to still be, you know, reserved and, and ease into it. I, I don't just call them out on the first day or second day of class. And they do have a couple of group projects. So the other benefit of, of the group work and the interaction is that the sooner they start interacting with others, the sooner they can start working on their group projects. And they naturally form you know, a study group or at least a, a support system within the class through the combination of, of assignments that we have. And the participation points, are they to do with their interaction and participation in class after having looked at some of the resources and the textbook or the videos that they've done in their own time? Exactly. So they come in with notes prepared. They've, they've taken a short assessment, maybe five to 10 questions. And I'll, I'll usually start with, they're telling me what they learned. I'll ask a couple of prompt questions. What did we, you know, what did we cover? And, and just to get, get a gauge of where their understanding is at. The, the benefit of the pre-lecture work is that they also have the opportunity to inform me through the last question on each assignment is, what do I need to spend more time on? What don't I understand? So I already have an idea of where the gaps are and what to address uh, and spend more time on in class. So the participation words aren't just, you know, do, do, you, do you understand everything? It's more, are you willing to take the risk to contribute to our learning environment? So whether it's they're working with um, their small group on an in-class activity or they're asking questions, they're somehow meaningfully engaged and not just sitting in the background, not quite interacting with others. And, you know, the first couple of weeks, you have to give them time to adjust because in many classes, they don't have that. And so once they get into the hang of it, and of course, the more vocal students help, you know, start that dynamic discussion, they do become more comfortable over time. And I'd say 80 to 85 percent of the students there are really actively engaged in discussion by week five. Oh, I'd say it really helps when you have a those active students that are able to display their understanding or even questioning the type of theories or principles and trying to get their head around it and it might bring up the other students to a certain level or even a higher grade than what they might have expected as you said there you had all but one uh, past the, the economics exam and that is a very high to be honest based on my own what I what I've seen it's a, a very high pass rate right and, and especially we have a very diverse student body from many different cultures which reflects Hawaii's population and different students from different backgrounds it's not customary for students to be contributing to what the class is learning so it does take them some time to adapt to that new environment but the, the discussions we have are just so much more, they're, they're broadened because students have different views and it, it keeps me in tune with, you know, what's on their radar as well. Maybe you have the way I'm explaining something doesn't quite work. And by the end of the semester, I'll have, you know, students chiming in and trying to explain to their peers, you know, in a different way with a different example that's more relevant to their generation maybe than, than my first few attempts. So it, it's just such a, a positive learning environment that they feel more comfortable and they know they're not alone 
because if they weren't interacting, they think I'm the only one who doesn't understand this, but they hear the questions of their peers and they know that they're not the only one. So that gives them some confidence too. And how do you maintain the interest for to these students? I know you that you do or use pop culture and also integrate local issues into your teaching, but are there any examples in which you do that or is that, are you leaving that in the control of the student to bring in this type of uh, understanding and relating economics to pop culture? So uh, I've been to a few conferences, seen some excellent presentations from Kim Holder, for example, and a bunch of her colleagues on how to integrate pop culture or how they integrate pop culture into education. And I was just blown away by how fun the class seemed and, and relevant to younger learners today. I've tried with music. So the, um, to my knowledge, the most common that I've seen is a lot of instructors try to use songs as examples of you know, what economic theories might be referenced or illustrated in the song. So I've done that. I play a song before class, um, which I know a lot of instructors do. And that always surprises them. You know, if you pick something that's more from their era than from, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, they think, you know, why are you playing this song? It kind of sets the mood. It ties into what they've covered for their previous night's assignment. You know, and who can identify a, a concept from, from last night's assignment in the song? And they remember it. They hear the song, they remember it later. If they find something in a sitcom, a movie, or hear something, um, bring it in and share. You know, get a couple of points for bringing in media to share. And that makes it more kind of like a treasure hunt for them that um, I'm, I'm going to find something and share it with the class, use it as an example. But I also try to do keep focus on local issues in Hawaii tie it into, you know, what we hear is a challenge for our communities, whether it's trying to, for example, um, Hawaii was the first state to adopt a goal for 100% renewable energy by the year 2045. How is it we're going to accomplish that in the next um, couple of decades? Things like that. And with that, I kind of have taken a turn now that I've established this, what I feel is a successful outcome with my flipped classroom. I have the student buy-in. Word has gotten around that if you take my class, you, you do all your homework up front, you come in. It does make you have to do all the homework, but it also makes it a, you know, uh, for a higher performance. Now that I have that buy-in, um, I'm, I'm trying to frame my classes around local issues that they'll be involved in being members of the community. So I'm teaching them about whether it's energy, whether it's our natural resource management, um, whether it's uh, a particular agricultural industry that's important to Hawaii's economy, trying to frame it around something that they know and that they can relate to and be proud of being from Hawaii, um, something that they hear a lot so that it's, it's, a, it's closer to home than just, you know, an example they read about in national news. And what would Hawaii have to, in terms of being a state, and we, we know, I'm sure we all know Hawaii and we kind of associate very warm weather and tropical weather. And obviously you're, you might have some thunderstorms and <laughs> on, on occasion, yes. And obviously with Hawaii, there's a, a different type of, how could I say it? The natives of Hawaii are somewhat different in terms of their values and their cultures. And is there any way you can specifically highlight how economics can be brought into that? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, so our campus at Kapilani Community College, I think it was last year, started to gather faculty together who might be interested in what we call Aina-based learning. Literally translated, Aina in Hawaiian means land. In their culture, it means much more than just the land that there is. It's really kind of what we consider gifts from nature in economics, right? Anything in any natural resource. But it's more of a cultural, spiritual connection to the life behind the land. And um, the Native Hawaiian and, and most indigenous cultures around the world, they perceive this kind of symbiotic relationship with the land. If, if you take care of the land, the land is what's taking care of you. And um, they treat it with a lot of respect because it does represent where they came from, the people who came before, and it's a resource that we will need to sustain into the future. And so this program, that we are, workshop that we attended, 
was trying to show us how we can, no matter what discipline we're in, whether we're, we're in um, a literature class, in economics, in biology, in, in chemistry, how we could incorporate a land or item-based assignment project into our curriculum, our standard curriculum, without actually changing the course. I had actually wanted to start doing something like that um, through this focus on Hawaii's different industries. So the timing worked out really nicely for me. And um, the first industry I was focusing on was fisheries, being an island state and surrounded by a very rich marine resource. Fishing is really important to our economy, both in the economic value, but also as a food source. And food sovereignty is an important issue these days. And a lot of times in Hawaii, when we talk about agriculture and self-sustainability there, we forget about the marine and the marine resource and all the fish that are there. So I was trying to integrate the economics course with looking at Hawaii's fisheries. And so I do have a new course actually this semester. One of my principles of micro classes, nothing's changed about the curriculum. It is the same standard microeconomics curriculum, but it's now being taught through the lens of Hawaii's fisheries. So they have a common context throughout the semester that the issues we talk about as we demonstrate different models, model of supply and demand, um, producer theory, comparison of market structures, all of that is taught also alongside the full picture of Hawaii's fishing industry. It incorporates this aina-based or land-based learning all throughout. We do go on a couple of field trips to connect with the resource itself. We visited a native Hawaiian fish pond um, a couple of weeks ago where the, you don't have to teach the word sustainability in Hawaiian language because the lifestyle they lived was in a way that helped ensure the health of the resource. Um, so we got to connect, you know, how do you keep a, a current day, present day sustainable fish stock, connect that to how did in ancient Hawaii, how did that work with, with the fish pond and the, the land use model that they had? Um, we will later this semester be going to the Honolulu Fish Auction, which is modeled after um, the auction in Tokyo, to really show, you know, auctioning, willingness to pay, and a lot of the, the market-based features there, as well as looking into Hawaii's commercial fishery side. And, and it really does, it, it teaches you what you need to know for the, th for the course, for the theory, for your degree program. But it also shows you, you know, here's one side to Hawaii's economy that you would probably never have really, you know, been exposed to without this course. So you have a much bigger appreciation for the food on your plate, where it came from, and, and the people who allowed it to be there. I'd love to see a case study of the differences between Hawaii and Ireland in terms of the fishery or the fishing industry. And when Ireland joined the EU back in the 1970s, uh -huh. then called the EEC, right. we gave up a lot of our waters on the Atlantic because we're at the edge of Europe and we have a vast amount of water and um, that's, that's Irish owned. And we gave a lot of that up to the EEC in order to become a member. And as a result, we gave up a lot of the, the fishing industry. And now we have many countries that are fishing off in those, are fishing in those waters that we, our fishermen can't, and fishing men and women can't even get access to because we've now narrowed the accessible points of which we can fish. And now there's stories or reports of overfishing and, um, and it, it can't be monitored. It can't be pleased. It's very challenging. And, um, for the students to hear, you know, it, we have similar similar issues with our exclusive economic zone, um, some marine sanctuaries, no take zones, um, different fishing methods, not in in Hawaiian waters, but that are possibly you know depleting stocks of fish that eventually will make their way to Hawaiian waters. A lot of it's a very challenging resource to manage. Um, the students are just they can't believe that they were otherwise unaware of these very important issues. So, you know, even if you can share that with one class of students who now are, you know, better informed citizens, you might even, I have a couple of students who I would say were converts, were so interested that when they transferred over to Manoa, the four-year 
university, um, they went down the path of environmental resource management. Um, they were on the business path, and now they have this new passion. And um, even one or two, they, they find what they think they were meant to do. It's, it's great. And even if they don't, even if they stay in a, as a business major, we're fine with that too. But they, they have a better understanding and can, can share with others. How promising is the washers of Hawaii in terms of the transportation and shipping routes? Are you part of the melting ice caps or is that more to the north where we have Canada? You know, um, in, in terms of like the effect of climate change and transportation of, of goods here. Yeah, because of the melting ice, ice caps, they could open up a new shipping route. I see. You know, I actually have not done any research. Or I, I'm not too familiar. No, that's fine. It's just uh, out of curiosity, it would have... Um, if it happened to be in that path of the uh, shipping route, would it threaten the self-sustainability of the fishing industry in Hawaii? That could be, and I, I should definitely now look into that. Um, I hadn't previously thought of that connection. I do know one other recent consideration in terms of impact on fishing tied to our very ambitious statewide energy goal. There is now reconsideration of installing a wind farm in open ocean to help us you know get a little closer to fully self-sustaining um, energy use so that would have an adverse impact not only on native bird population but also on on the marine resource as well so that that's one definite impact and this is something that is so relevant and so topical at the moment is the climate change and how you're addressing that at a principal's level is very important for your students to get to get to understand what's happening at a micro level, I suppose, and perhaps at a macro level. And we've seen a positive impact with those the example of the students who've gone on to do the further education in resource and climate change. Yes. I, I always felt that some students really missed opportunities because typically you don't get um, kind of a field class, right? You wouldn't take a class on um, international trade or a class on environmental resources until you get to an intermediate level in economics. And unless you're an economics major, at least in my experience in our, in our um, school system, students don't take intermediate level courses beyond like in macro and micro theory unless they're a major. But if we could demonstrate to new learners, either they may be on another path or they just may not know exactly what it is they want to do, that if you can expose them to these other issues and, and these other possible disciplines at the get-go, that might spark an interest and that might might be something they would consider. So um, the other purpose of changes I've made um, to my presentation is to also show that economics isn't just for business majors, which is a common misconception that my first year students have is that, oh, I'm in ecology or I'm in, we even have a culinary school here. I'm in um, hospitality. It's not just for the business aspects, that there's so much more to economics and it's so universally applicable that no matter what your discipline, you can definitely benefit from it. I totally agree with that. And to be honest, Talking to a lot of economists and academics like yourself, Jacqueline, it's really opened up my eyes in how economics is actually everywhere, you know, from applying economics to piracy. I've had them all, you know, really. And I'm, I'm so glad to have this type of exposure and this type of discussion. And, and you're totally 100% correct. It's, it's not just for business majors. You know, if you could apply economic thinking, if you have a background in ecology or sociology or what, what, who knows, culinary arts, you could find some type of thinking in economics that you could apply to your own absolutely, discipline. Absolutely. Absolutely. So towards the end of the semester is when they say, I now see everything so differently. And it's hard for me to see something and not see the economic side of it and that's when you know you've really done your job when they can't see it the way they used to and they now see it you know through the lens of an economist Jacqueline I'd love to know how you got into economics or what was the transition 
had was there one particular point in time where you were introduced to economics and discovered it and thought, yes, this is where I'm going to go? Or did you have it already? Was there an influence that kind of guided you quite early on to find this uh, route in, in your career? So when someone asks that question, I usually tell them, you know, for most people, at least a lot of people I know, it's not something you dream of when you grow up. I want to be an economist. Um, no one in my family had an economics background. I'm sure if you're the, the student of a professor, that's very different. But um, I had no inclinations. I didn't even know what economics was until um, I was trying to transfer into the business school and I was told I had to take these classes. I was actually initially um, a political science major. I thought I wanted to go to law school. And um, I, at one point, considered business school and had taken a couple of econ classes and it was so logical for me it fit with my my thinking style and I did really well in it and I thought well maybe maybe this is something I could consider business school I turned out it, it wasn't something I wanted to do um, so I ended up with a political science economics background as an undergrad and I realized the world doesn't need another attorney um, in me. And I decided I'm just going to keep going to school because I really liked the discipline. I, I wanted more. So I applied to the PhD program at Manoa at home. And a lot of things happened. It turned out just because of good timing. Um, my first semester, I was assigned as a teaching assistant to one of the faculty at the econ department who was a health economist. Initially, I thought I was going to go into natural resource management because I was very interested in um, Pacific Island cultures and their use. And eventually there's commercialization of a lot of those resources. But because of that assignment that I got, and I, I had a very good working relationship with my faculty member, you know, he said, you should really consider health because this was early pre-affordable care act and it was really that momentum building up to it and he said you know there's just so much coming in the industry it's constantly changing and I saw what he had done and, and what role he played in our local healthcare community and I, I thought oh this is this is really interesting too so I kind of veered off my original path and I fell it I could just kind of fell into to healthcare but it's like you said, because it's constantly changing, there's always something new. I really found a, a love there in my work, in my research. So it, it was partly by chance, but partly just exploring new things. Um, and that's how I got into healthcare. But once I started teaching in the classroom, I, I didn't want to leave. So I have put that aside. And now I'm, I'm back sharing econ with new learners. Yeah, and you, you've actually done this at a national level as well, because I found you through a competition that Kim Holder holds called Rockonomics. Oh, yeah. And yeah, so you're, you're again, you're bringing in that music and applying or changing the lyrics or encouraging students to change lyrics up that tell a story about a particular uh, law and economics or principles or whatever it might be and uh, sing that song and create the video. And how was that as a learning experience for those students? I, I'm sure it was a lot of fun, but quite nerve wracking as well at the same time. Right. Kim's initiative there is just to take that class project to a national level competition has to be commended. That's a huge accomplishment. Um, when I first heard about her competition, I thought that was something I wanted my students to be a part of. And I, I offered it as an extra credit assignment because I wasn't sure how students would take to the workload associated with, you know, filming and with technical production. And, um, you know, I didn't know what skill sets they had. But, you know, our, our young generation of, of students, they're very technologically savvy and they figure things out on their own. By the time they hit high school, they can do all of these things, a lot of these students. So um, after a few semesters of offering it as an extra credit assignment, um, the feedback, they, there, there was an assessment component, not just, you know, are you having fun while you're doing it? But, you know, did you consult the textbook? Did you work better with having a group dynamic? Were you able to form a study group? Did you find that helpful in learning other concepts, studying for the exam? So the feedback that I got from their participation, they said, yes, it was, you know, an additional workload, but at the same time, they found so much value in it and felt it performs better that I've 
I've I've kept it in as an actual assignment. It's been so great for their experience. You always get the face at the beginning when you tell them, this is what you're going to be doing for our project. No, I can't do that. No, I don't want to be on camera. No, I don't want to do that. But, you know, they... Nobody dropped the class <laughs> because of it, and they slowly warm up to it. and And they have a group. They have a group of in my class up to to five people. And you know, everyone has a different skill, a different talent. So leverage your talent, specialize, and and they end up more. Most groups end up working very well together. And regardless of how the video turns out, yes, it is a competition, and yes, we do want to go back and win again. But regardless of how their videos turn out, it's the experience they have of working with other people, some of the soft skills that they can now take with them um, when they leave, and also the to really write lyrics with economics integrated into it. You really have to have a nuanced understanding of these concepts and how they apply in a, in a real world situation. So I've been very impressed with, with the quality of products that have been produced by this project. So we're going to stick with it because I have fun watching them go through this journey and I hear them having conversations about how their meetings went. And, and the best part is when they share with you the outtakes from, from their footage. <laughs> it's so great. I've had students who move to the islands as new residents. Um, they don't know anyone here. They have no friends. They have no support group. And, and through this project, they now have friends in the class, our friends on the island, people to study with. You know, they've, they've built connections with people. And, and that kind of feedback just reinforces that, you know, it has so much more meaning just beyond the, the finished product. So, Jacqueline, can I ask you about, the, if it's okay, the macro economy of Hawaii? I, I don't know much about Hawaii in terms of the economy, but say, for example, the population or the average income? Sure. Um, our population, so I used to reference our, um, all of this data a, a lot more in my health economist days, being aware of the, the population that we're serving. So it's, it's been a little while. Um, so please don't quote these exact numbers. I will, I will kind of ballpark it for you. Our, our state population is just over a million. It's approximately, last I checked, about 1.3 million statewide, with the vast majority of those individuals living on Oahu, um, where Honolulu is located. So we do have other neighboring islands with just much smaller, more rural areas. Our average incomes, oh, I'm a little less hesitant, I'm a little more hesitant to, to quote that one, because that's a big, that could be a big mistake. <laughs> um, I I, I want to say it's in the 40s, 40,000, based on our Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism statistics. Um, it's in the I believe it's in the 40,000 range. But our biggest problems here recently have focused on certain social issues like homelessness and affordable housing because our median home prices here are in, depending on if you're looking at median or, or mean, anywhere from the 600 to the 700,000. Um, so that's, that's been one big issue that, we, you know, our average incomes are relatively lower compared to comparable jobs in the same industries on the U.S. mainland, but our cost of living here is, is much higher. Our primary industry upon which we are very dependent is tourism. It, historically, a lot of our tourists have come from Japan, from East Asia, as well as the U.S. mainland and other parts. But we now, because of lax visa laws, we now have a lot of um, Chinese tourists as well. So a lot of our economy is supported by those tourists. It would be interesting to see if some of the inflation is being imported by these tourists and whether they're investing in properties locally. Yes, yes, there is a lot of um, foreign investment. We have had a very... A, a pretty big boom in construction. Um, a lot of condos, a lot of high rises. We don't have much land space left. So what, what little space that is being redeveloped, a lot of them are high rises. So Hawaii's landscape is changing. Sometimes I hear uh, tourists saying, you know, I was here 20 years ago or I was here 15 years ago for my honeymoon. And now we're back with the family, with the grandkids. And, and they're very surprised at how much even just Waikiki has changed. 
Um, but, but that's a concern as well. Um, you know, how much is the landscape changing and what do we have left that we, we would like to keep in, in and, and restore versus develop um, for commercial uses? So we've seen a lot of the agricultural products disappear. We used to have most, a lot of people in Hawaii have a sugarcane plantation background where our grandparents' parents came to work in the sugar plantations, whether it was from Okinawa, whether it was from Portugal, whether it was from the Philippines. And those who came stayed and had families intermingled, which is why we have a very culturally diverse um, population. When you ask someone, which is common, what ethnicity are you? you? You don't get one or two, you get sometimes five or six, which is very common here. And that's one of the beautiful things about Hawaii is that you have so many different ethnic cultures represented. But the sugarcane plantations are gone. The pineapple plantations are gone. And we've seen Hawaii's even agricultural landscape changing for better or for worse. So there's been a lot of change over the last several decades in terms of Hawaii's economy looks like. But tourism, definitely, and construction, Construction is another big one, like residential commercial construction. That's something that, again, almost mirrors Ireland, perhaps not in the extent of tourism, but the fact that we were such a heavily dependent on agriculture and then moved into construction before our housing market collapsed. Given that highways is also surrounded by water similar to Ireland, again, I'd love to explore the, the similarities between the state of Hawaii and the country of Ireland. And Jacqueline, if you could step into the, the DeLorean and time travel, what era would you go back to and who would you like to meet and what conversation would you t- think you'd have with them? So um, my grandfather was born on Maui, actually. not. I, I live on Oahu. He was born on Maui because his father had emigrated from Okinawa to Maui by himself at we think, age 16, and left his family behind. He met my great-grandmother, who was born on Maui there, and and they started their family. And I've always heard stories of my grandfather saying when he grew up, um, when they lived on the plantation, before they went to school, you know, what chores they had to do, what chickens they had to go and catch and and, and prepare for the day. And... um, just that lifestyle, that plantation lifestyle, because that's so many people's family history here in Hawaii. It was a tough life having to work the fields and support your family that way. But just to, just to see a snapshot of what it looks like, we've gone, I've taken my grandfather back to Maui recently um, for some, some family events. And we drive through the, the plantation town that he used to, he lived in, that he grew up in. And there, there's none of it left because the entire hillside has been torn down to build a new housing development and so he'd say you know the mango tree was here but the general store is still there because now it's a tourist destination but the rest of it was gone it's just you know you can kind of mimic the road that used to be there so just to see what it used to be like back then with all of those different families we had um, Japanese we had a lot of Filipinos Portuguese and they all had their little communities but the way that they communicated with one another even though they didn't speak the other language they somehow managed to to help each other out and to to take care of each other so just getting to see a snapshot back in time of kind of what life was like but also the experience my grandfather went through we hear all of his stories just to see it if we if they had video at that time you know we don't have a quick little video we could see but that that would be nice and that almost brings a full circle in which you were talking mentioned earlier on about respecting the land and how to treat the land more favorably so that uh, you can live off the land by the land giving back to you and you giving to the land and I'm sure that goes back to those earlier times and the plantations. Yeah, I think maybe the the culture of the families there, the plantations themselves, because they were single crop, single crop plantations that removed all the biodiversity of the land, the plantations themselves actually destroyed the land. But I think the people that lived there and the values that they brought, that still kept alive that feeling of, taking care and and giving back. 
Jacqueline, I'd love to know if you have any takeaway that you'd like to share with anybody who is in your position in academia who wants to maybe go ahead and teach a flipped style classroom. How did it get started, perhaps? Sure. For smaller classroom sizes and institutions that have the more intimate classroom style that we have, I really think it is possible for any faculty to, to do that if you're interested. It is a big time commitment up front because you do have to have all of that material prepped ahead of time and to find one that you feel the students will benefit most from that search process could take some time. But luckily, most campuses do have resources available that if that's something you're interested in, whether it's through like the library resource specialists, we have um, some who are constantly going through like OER or like open source free materials and are just feed us stuff all the time that they come across. And they're such great researchers or whether it's through like our IT department, they have education backgrounds, but it's technology with education. Whatever resources your campus has, I would recommend leveraging them just because they could save you a lot of time or at least narrow your scope and say, here's what's available. But your publisher, whoever your publisher is or your author of your text, might also have some recommendations. As a community college, we do try to minimize the cost to our our students who largely support themselves. But it is possible. It is possible to get them a very high quality set of materials that works best for you in the classroom and it really just takes I think it's more taking the risk As instructors that I've talked to said you know I've thought about flipping my classroom but but I just can't give up that lecture because and I felt this before that I needed my students to hear it from me and you know we're economists we we should specialize in what we can do best if they can read and prep even the basics the the concepts, the terms, the definitions on their own and use their time that way, then your time is freed up to show them, make the connection, give them the real world example, create an interactive activity for the class. That class time, it's so valuable and and it it goes a long way. And I think for me, what really solidified it, I knew they were learning, but when they had a smile on their face and and a professor next door came in and said, what were you guys doing today? Because I heard all this laughing and they were, it just sounded so positive. And we were talking about elasticities that day. That says something that when the psychology instructor next door, who's usually the one having fun in class says, what were you guys doing? It was so great. And we were talking about elasticities that hit it out of the park for me. So I knew I was doing whatever it is the students, you know, would have the most fun with. So I think it just takes you taking the risk. It can be done. It'll take, yes, a little extra development time. But the reward with a successful model, I think it really goes a long way. And, and you can have fun with it. Class is so much more fun for me. Um, I mean, I always like talking about economics, whether I'm just drawing a graph on the board and, you know, blah, blah, blahing up front. But it's not as fun as when you see the student's positive reaction. So I leave class totally satisfied. And um, when they say, you know, it's hard, but I like it and and it makes me want to come to class, then you can't not be satisfied with that. Exactly. And we all know about the risk reward ratio. And if you get your students laughing during elasticity class, well, it's definitely worth the risk. Yeah. Jacqueline, thank you so much for being so inspiring and for joining me on Economic Rockstar. I had a blast and I personally learned a lot from you and I can't wait to try out some of those flip classroom tips, actually. Share it again with our listeners where they could find you. I am on Twitter. Um, I, I'm, I'm still learning social media um, and still trying to, you know, be able to share a little bit more on there. Um, but my handle is Coffeenomics. My personal love of coffee combined with economics, both on on Twitter and Instagram, which is actually my next integrated class is going to be on Hawaii's coffee industry. Yeah, um, I'm there. I do also have um, a website for our students club, the Economics and Business Club. And so a lot of the educational content um, we try to feed as resources onto that site, which is www.ebcat. KCC.com. So that's e- E-B-C-A-T-K-C-C.com. Yeah, I would say EBC at KCC, but it's not the at symbol. So we have some of our student-fed content on that site. 
You can find all the links to Jacqueline on economicrockstar.com forward slash Jacqueline Lindo. Jacqueline, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. You are an economic rock star. Thank you, Frank. Thanks for having me. I had fun. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.